the untold truth about the Holy Spirit. In the journey of faith, understanding the role of the Holy Spirit in overcoming sin is crucial for every believer. The Holy Spirit, according to the Bible, is not an ethereal concept, but a vital part of the Godhead, known as the Trinity. In the words of Jesus himself, as recorded in John chapter 14, verse 26, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. This passage reveals two essential truths. The Holy Spirit has a distinct personality within the Trinity and the role he plays in guiding and confronting those who follow Christ. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit as part of the Trinity is considered as one God in three persons. The Trinity, three divine persons, the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is just as divine and powerful as God the Father and Jesus the Son. Even though it's hard to understand, the Bible shows this truth in many places. The Holy Spirit's role extends beyond creation and moves into the heart of human experience. He is a helper, teacher, and comforter. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Holy Spirit also empowers us to live a life that pleases God, produces fruit such as love, joy, and peace. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23 and impart spiritual gifts for the building up of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. Sin that stops you from hearing the Holy Spirit. Sin is shown to be something that does a lot more than break rules. It affects the special connection between God and us. Think about how things started perfectly in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve could spend time with God like friends. But then, when they sinned, created a big problem that made people grow distant from God. The Bible clearly shows how sin changed, how we could feel and understand things about God. The Holy Spirit, often described as the breath of God, moves through believers' lives in profound and subtle ways. This was the case in the creation of man in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Right from the start, the Spirit of God was present, hovering over the formless void, which was a symbol of potential and divine influence, preparing to bring forth life in all its fullness. As the days of creation unfolded, God spoke the world into existence with his word. Then, on the sixth day, something extraordinary happened. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27. Here we see a plural pronoun, us, which includes the Holy Spirit, indicates a collaborative act in the creation of humanity. The very inception of sin brought about an immediate barrier. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God had forbidden, the consequences were disastrous. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim, and the flaming sword which turned every way, to guard the way to the tree of life. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were sent out of the beautiful garden called Eden. But it wasn't just about being sent away from a place. They lost the close and special friendship they used to have with God. It's like when you do something wrong and you feel like you can't even look someone in the eye anymore. That's how it was with them and God. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 puts it this way, saying our wrongs can create a gap between us and God, making it feel like he's hiding his face and not listening to us. So, sin isn't just breaking a rule. It's like building a big wall that stops us from being close to God and feeling His love and goodness. As one progresses through the biblical narrative, it becomes evident that sin has a numbing effect on the conscience. The New Testament speaks of this dulling of conscience as well. Before Jesus' death and resurrection, 
Before Jesus' death, the Holy Spirit was seen as the force that inspires the prophets. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. It was a presence that could come upon people, giving them power and wisdom, like it did with judges, kings, and prophets in the Old Testament. But it didn't necessarily dwell in them permanently. Jesus, before his crucifixion, promised his disciples that the Holy Spirit would come after he left them. In John chapter 16, verse 7, he said, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Comforter will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. This was a promise that the Holy Spirit would be sent to all believers as a permanent indwelling presence, not just a temporary gift to a few individuals. Holy Spirit and Day of Pentecost. After the death of Jesus, something extraordinary happened in the city of Jerusalem, a moment so powerful it would change the course of history. The Holy Spirit made a dramatic entrance during the day of Pentecost. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. This event marked the church's beginning and the gospel spread through the believer's empowerment. It was only a short time after Jesus had ascended to heaven. His friends and followers were gathered together as he had instructed them to wait in Jerusalem for a unique gift, the Holy Spirit. This group of about 120 believers, including the apostles, were all together in one place, united in prayer and expectation. Then, on the day of Pentecost, a Jewish festival 50 days after Passover, the waiting and praying erupted into a miraculous event. Suddenly, there was a sound like the rushing of a mighty wind from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Picture a fierce, howling wind, so strong you could feel it tingling on your skin, so loud it filled your ears with a roar. And something even more astonishing happened. What looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. Imagine seeing a flame, flickering and dancing without burning, alighting gently upon the head of each person there, it was a sign, something visible to show an invisible reality. God himself was touching them. At that moment, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. It was like an invisible force had swept into their very being, empowering them from the inside out. And they started speaking in different languages that they didn't know before because the Holy Spirit helped them to do it. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Acts chapter 2, verse 6. People from all over the world were in Jerusalem for the festival, and they were amazed. They each heard the believers speaking in their own native language. It was miraculous. They were declaring the wonders of God, sharing the powerful deeds He had done, and everyone could understand in their own tongue. It was as if a divine hand was knitting together the hearts of people from different nations through his supernatural event. Some people didn't take the believers seriously. They thought they were just acting foolish because they had too much wine. But Peter, who was one of Jesus' best friends, stood up with the rest of Jesus' special helpers, and he started talking to the crowd. He was really brave and spoke so everyone could understand him. He told them that this amazing thing that was happening was just like what Joel, a man who spoke God's words a long time ago, said would happen. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Peter told them about Jesus how he had been crucified and raised from the dead, and that God had made him both Lord and Christ. The people were cut to the heart, deeply moved by the Holy Spirit's conviction, and they asked what they should do. Peter's response was clear. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2, verse 
38. That day, about 3,000 people took Peter's message to heart, were baptized, and added to the group of believers. It was the beginning of a new community, a church empowered by the Holy Spirit. They started showing a new and powerful kind of love and generosity that attracted many more people to follow Jesus. This event, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, was the spark that ignited the early church's flame, which continues to burn across the world to this day. It demonstrated that God's presence and power had not been restricted to just one place or one person, but was poured out from all who would believe, a promise that holds true even now. The Holy Spirit is essential for living a life that pleases God. The Holy Spirit enables us to do what is right and avoid what is wrong. The Holy Spirit is also a seal to our relationship with God, guaranteeing our inheritance as children of God in future resurrection. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. When we consider how specific sins can prevent our ability to hear the Holy Spirit, it is crucial to understand that the Spirit communicates with a heart that is open, repentant, and aligned with God's will. Here's a breakdown of how certain sins can prevent that communication. Unconfessed sin. Biblical examples in the book of Psalms. David talks about his own experience with unconfessed sin. He says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Psalm chapter 32, verse 3. David felt stuck in his spiritual life because he didn't admit his wrongdoing, and this bothered him inside. John writes, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Confession and repentance are the acts of turning away from sin and turning back to God clearing the path for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Pride. King Saul was a typical example of a king whose pride brought a barrier between him and God. In 1 Samuel 15, Saul directly disobeyed God by sparing the best of the Amalekites' livestock. When confronted by the prophet Samuel, Saul's initial denial revealed his prideful heart, ultimately leading to his rejection as king. The story illustrates how pride can lead to spiritual deafness. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. James chapter 4, verse 6. Pride can be in the way of listening to what the Holy Spirit wants to tell us. This happens because being too proud can make us think we are more important than we really are and that we can do everything by ourselves. So, we end up believing that our own ideas are better than God's advice. Bitterness and unforgiveness. Jesus tells the story of a servant who, after being forgiven a great debt, refuses to forgive a small debt owed by another. The parable ends with the unforgiving servant being handed over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Matthew chapter 18, verse 34. This illustrates the spiritual imprisonment that comes with unforgiveness. Holding on to bitterness and not forgiving others can interfere in the Spirit's work in us. As Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 through 32 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Restoring the ability to hear the Holy Spirit. Repentance. The gentle whisper of the Holy Spirit can be drowned out in our world today. Restoring the ability to hear this divine guide often requires a return to the foundational principles of repentance, forgiveness, humility, obedience, and community. Repentance is a powerful act, not merely feeling sorry for wrongdoing, but a determined change in direction. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says, Repent then, turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. This refreshing speaks to the restorative power of repentance. It cleanses the conscience and unblocks the channels to God. By acknowledging our sins and deciding to turn away from them, we effectively remove the debris that clogs our spiritual ears. Forgiveness. The pursuit of forgiveness is central to Christianity, rooted in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. To hear the Holy Spirit, one must seek forgiveness from God for their sins, a divine reset that restores spiritual harmony. Moreover, 
Seeking forgiveness from those we have wronged is equally important as it is written in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 24. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Reconciliation with others reduces the noise of guilt and conflict, making the voice of the Holy Spirit more discernible. Humility and obedience. Being humble is like having good soil where your ability to take in and grow from spiritual experiences can thrive. James chapter 4, verse 6 reminds us that God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. A humble person is more willing to follow directions, and when we do what we're told, we get better at hearing what God wants to tell us. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. John chapter 10, verse 27. When we submit our wills to God's, we not only hear His voice more clearly, but are also empowered to follow it. Community and accountability. No believer is an island. We are called to live in community. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 encourages believers to carry each other's burdens, and in the way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Community provides accountability, ensuring that we remain on the path of righteousness. When we stray, a brother or sister in Christ can gently guide us back, ensuring that our spiritual lives remains unobstructed. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25 underscores the importance of this fellowship. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. In simple terms, to restore the ability to hear the Holy Spirit, one must turn away from sin and towards God, repentance, make things right with God and others, forgiveness, adopt a posture of humble obedience, humility and obedience, and walk alongside others who will keep them true to their calling, community and accountability. As these steps are practiced, the static of life fades, and the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit becomes a clear and guiding presence. In following God, it's essential to know how doing wrong things can get in the way of us hearing God's guidance. Doing wrong is like a big wall that keeps us from getting close to the Holy Spirit. It's like when there's so much noise around that you can't hear someone trying to whisper to you. The Bible explains it like this. Your wrongdoings have put a gap between you and your God and your sins have made him hide his face from you, so he can't hear you. Isaiah 59, verse 2. The invitation to examine one's life is not meant to be a burden, but a liberating process. As the Apostle Paul advised, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Regular self-examination is a healthy spiritual discipline that can identify and weed out those sins that silence the voice of the Holy Spirit. But the message here is not solely one of self-scrutiny and realization of wrongdoing. It is predominantly one of hope, for our God is a fountain of ceaseless grace. His love does not draw back at our shortcomings, but reaches out with the tender promise of forgiveness and restoration. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. This cleansing is not a one-time event, but a continuous offering to all who earnestly seek to align with the Holy Spirit. Let's hold on to this special gift and let it help us get back on track with our spiritual connection. It's like we're joining in a dance with God's Spirit, listening to the soft nudges that guide us along. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. John chapter 14, verse 16. This means we always have help on our journey to listen and stay close to the Holy Spirit, even when he makes mistakes. Overall, the Holy Spirit is God's empowering presence, giving us the strength, wisdom, and guidance needed to live lives that honor him. It's a divine helper available to all who believe in Jesus Christ and accept Him as their Lord and Savior. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father. In the quiet of this moment, we come before you, seeking the gentle whisper of your Holy Spirit. We acknowledge, O Lord, that at times our actions, words, and thoughts create a barrier to the soft, guiding voice you have placed within us. We confess that our sins, those moments of weakness, of deliberate turning away, dim the vibrant connection we so deeply desire with you. God, please let us hear and feel your Holy Spirit. We want to feel him push, find comfort in him, and go where he leads us. We know that when we mess up or get caught up in bad stuff, it makes it hard for us to feel and listen to the Holy Spirit. We are asking for your kindness to forgive us. Make our hearts clean and put us back on the right path. Help us to stop feeling guilty, to let go of our anger, to break down our pride, and to stop fooling ourselves. Instead, please give us the strength to be humble, to accept our wrongs, and to choose to live in the kindness of your love. Teach us to discern the difference between the noise of the world and the quiet counsel of the Holy Spirit. May we learn to still ourselves, to wait patiently for your guidance, and to act upon it with courage and faith. Holy Spirit, come and be a part of our lives again. Give us understanding, bring peace into our hearts, and give us the courage to live in a way that shows the kindness and caring of God. We are so grateful to you, God, for always being with us, for the special gift of your Spirit, and for your love that never gives up on us, even when we make mistakes. We ask for these things and find fresh hope in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.